Welcome to Chapter 4, Functional Anatomy of Prokaryotic and Eukaryotic Cells. Once again, I'm going to be chopping this into two pieces, so this will be Part 1. This chapter fulfills the objective to provide students with the knowledge necessary to com comprehend the fundamentals of microbiology, specifically the anatomy of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. For this chapter, we're going to cover comparing prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. In part one, we're going to cover comparing prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells and part of prokaryotic cells. For the second half, we'll finish up prokaryotic cells and move on to eukaryotic cells. For this class though, since you will be uh, covering eukaryotic cells in lots of other classes, we'll be focusing mainly on prokaryotic cells. Let's start by doing a quick overview of the basic characteristics of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. I like to use the analogy of getting a quick overview of the forest before you get distracted by individual trees. Now from chapter one, you may have remembered that prokaryotes are divided into two groups, archaea and bacteria. For the purposes of this chapter, when we say we meaning me, say prokaryotes, what I'm really meaning is bacteria. For eukaryotes, this includes fungi and protista, plants, and animals including humans. Okay, now for the characteristics of prokaryotes, specifically bacteria. They have no nucleus. The nucleus is a membrane-bound organelle that is the largest organelle in the cell. By organelle I mean little organs that are inside the cell. They're not really organs because organs are composed of multiple cells, but you get the idea. A nucleus protects the DNA or the chromosome of the cell. Bacteria don't have this. They do have a circular chromosome. They don't have any histones. Histones are proteins that are used to wind up the chromosome and there are no membrane enclosed organelles. Um, so not only do they not have a nucleus, they don't have the other membrane enclosed organelles. Their cell walls are made up of peptidoglycan, you may remember that from chapter one, and they divide or reproduce asexually by binary fission. Now for eukaryotes. All eukaryotes have a nucleus. That's what divides the eukaryotes from the prokaryotes. Most of them have a linear chromosome. That means there's two ends. They have proteins called histones that are used to wind up the chromosomes. They have membrane enclosed organelles. If they do have a cell wall, they never have peptidoglycan. And when the cells divide asexually, they divide either, uh, the nucleus by the process of either mitosis or meiosis. Now we're going to go over some of this in more detail as we discuss the different parts of the cells, but once again, this is the forest before we get distracted by the individual trees. In this next section, we're going to talk about the size, shape, and arrangement of bacterial cells, structures external to the cell wall, the cell wall, and structures internal to the cell wall. On this slide, I've listed a bunch of Latin terms that are used to describe the shape and arrangement of bacterial cells. You're going to have to memorize them, I'm sorry. As we go through the following slides, I'll be using these terms, so hopefully that'll help you get a handle on the vocabulary. But these are vocabulary terms that you're going to need to learn. Let's start with the cocci or the round bacteria. Now when you divide a circle, you can do so either this way this way and then this way or this way, this way, this way. It all depends upon the bacterial species. Now some cells, some round cocci cells, once they divide they have a tendency to separate and they become single cocci. Others have a tendency to still hold hands and the degree to which they remain attached affects their arrangement. Now up here you'll see these are diplococci they have a tendency to stay together in pairs. So when you look under the microscope, you'll see them in pairs mainly. Others hang on for longer, and these are the streptococci. When you get strep throat, it is from a species of bacterium that uh, tends to stay together in chains or strep. 
Now others have a tendency to form these little sets of four, these flat little squares. We call these tetrads. They're quite rare, but in lab you'll be seeing at least one species that tends to form tetrads. They're kind of fun. Now if you form a cube, these little guys, we call these sarcina. Now, if you get clusters, grape-like clusters, this is Staphylo, specifically Staphylococci. If you get a Staph infection, it's generally caused by a species of bacterium that tends to form these grape-like clusters. Um, now, when you're in lab and you're looking under the microscope, have a tendency to want to call clusters of rods Staphylo. A rod is not shaped like a grape. So Staphylo only applies to cocci. Remember that one. Now let's talk about the rod-shaped bacteria. These are bacilli, bacilli being the plural. Now rods, generally speaking, can only divide this direction. There are a few bacteria that can divide this direction, but we're not going to be looking at any of them in lab. Now if you have just a single bacilli or bacillus, we call that single bacilli. If they have a tendency to hang on for a little bit, they can be diplo bacilli. You can also get strepto bacilli. Um, no staphylobacilli. Remember that. Now, down here at the bottom, we have kind of a lumpy, short, little rod, little bacilli. Now, when you look at these under the microscope, if they're long enough, that they're just getting ready to divide, they look like short little rods. If they've just divided, they look like cocci. Now this confused microbiologists for years and we had a tendency to call them coxobacilli or a combination of round and rod shaped. But what's happening is they are these short lumpy little rods as you can see from the electron micrograph. Now E. coli is a coxobacilli. So don't let that confuse you if you happen at some point in looking at your E. coli to see all cocci and other points to see all short little rods or at other times a mix of the two. That doesn't mean that you've contaminated your culture, that you have a, a non-pure culture. It just means that E. coli is annoying. It's a coxobacilli. Once rods or bacilli get long enough, depending upon the bacterial species, they can start doing some fun things. For example, they can curve. Now up here at the top, we have a type of bacterium that tends to form short curved rods that look like commas. We call this Vibrio. Cholera is an example of a Vibrio. Now if they get even longer, they can form these spirals or helical shapes. Now they come in two kinds. If they are rigid and they have flagella usually coming out of each end, then they are spirillium. If they are flexible and usually longer and they don't have any visible flagella sticking out of the end, they are spirochetes. Now that we've talked about the uh, shapes and arrangements, arrangements would be whether they're diplo or strepto or any of those. Now that we've talked about the shape and arrangement of prokaryotes, bacteria, let's talk about the structures external to the cell wall. We're going to be talking about the glycocalyx, flagella, endoflagella, axial filaments, fimbrae, and pili. Glycocalyx means sugar cup and it refers to the glycocalyx being composed mainly of carbohydrates. Now the glycocalyx performs two functions preventing the cell from being eaten by amoeba-like cells and two, helping it stick to stuff. Now sometimes both forms of the glycocalyx can perform both functions, but for the purpose of, the, of this class we're going to say that they're two separate functions. What in the world am I talking about? Well if you look at this micrograph of these bacteria that have a glycocalyx around them, the, and that's the white clear area around the dark cells. The glycocalyx in this situation is very tight around the cells. Kind of wraps them in a slippery cocoon. We call this a capsule. 
and it prevents the bacteria from being eaten by other amoeba-like cells, or the fancy term for that is phagocytized. Generally speaking, if this is a pathogen, they are more pathogenic if they have a capsule because it prevents your white blood cells from phagocytizing them, from eating them down. Now the other form of the glycocalyx is the slime layer. That's where the carbohydrates are less attached, less closely attached to the cell, and they have a tendency to be more sticky. And uh, its function of the slime layer is to stick to other cells and to stick to other surfaces. They have a, a prime function in forming biofilms. So in the morning when you wake up with tooth fuzz, okay, all of those bacteria that have been dividing throughout the night, they have been producing a slime layer that allows them to attach to each other and to your teeth. By the way, you might want to break out a toothbrush and bust up that lovely biofilm. Flagella are hair-like structures that stick out from the bacterial cell and allow the bacterium to swim around. Okay, you can see the flagellum here. Flagellum is singular, by the way. Now, if the flagella comes just out of one end and there's just one of them, we call this monotrichus. Trichus is Greek, I believe, or Latin, for hair. So it's monohaired. Now, if you have a cluster coming out of one end, we call that lophotrichus. Now, if they're coming out of both ends, now we call it ampitrichus. Ampi, if you're ambidextrous, you use both hands equally. So this one has flagella coming out of both ends. And you see that on spirillium more often than not. And then if you have flagella all over the place, you are peritrichus. Let's talk about the structure and movement of flagella. And you're probably wondering, why bother? Well, it becomes important later on when we talk about the difference between prokaryotic flagella and eukaryotic flagella. Now, prokaryotic flagella are composed of a molecule of protein called, well, it's a protein, which is a molecule, and it's called flagellin. That should make it easier to remember. And it's stiff and it comes out of the cell wall. It's embedded in the cell membrane, goes through the cell wall, comes out, and it's set up with these discs so that the flagella can turn 360 like a little outboard motor. Later on, I'm going to have a little film of swimming bacteria that you can see the flagella spinning. Now, later on, we're going to talk about the difference between uh, gram-positive and gram-negative bacterium. But if you look over here, the one to the left is gram-positive. It's got just one thick peptidoglycan cell wall. Gram-negatives because they have two membranes, one thin layer of peptidoglycan. They're a little bit more complicated, but they still spin 360 and they're composed of flagellin. Spirochetes have a specific structure to their flagella that are called endoflagella. They're kind of like ingrown hairs. What happens is the flagella come out of the cell wall, but then they come back underneath an external sheath. It's kind of like a capsule. You'll notice on this micrograph you can see where they have both, you know, where we've got both flagella meeting. You can see two of them. You can see just one right here. And we call this endoflagella. What happens is when the flagellum spins, instead of spinning just the flagellum, spins the whole cell. So when you look at it underneath the microscope, they go spinning through the medium like little corkscrews. And this is seen only in spirochetes. Fimbrae and pili are both composed of a protein called pilin. That makes it easier to remember. And it used to be that the two terms, fimbrae and pili, were used interchangeably. Now they're separated mainly based upon what they do. Fimbrae are used to attach to other cells and to surfaces. Uh, they can kind of fulfill the same purpose as a glycocalyx. Pili, on the other hand, are specific for grabbing a hold of other bacteria for the purpose of exchanging genetic material. We'll be talking more about pili and their function in this purpose in Chapter 8. In this next section, we're going to talk about the cell wall of prokaryotes.
specifically bacteria. We're going to talk about what they're composed of, the characteristics of gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls, and why the gram stain stains the way that it does. We're going to talk about atypical cell walls, specifically those of mycoplasma, archaea, and acid-fast bacteria. Then we're going to end up with damage to the cell wall, since this is what an awful lot of um, antibiotics and disinfectants, sterilants, do is damage the cell wall. For this discussion, we're going to be referring heavily to uh, stuff that you learned in Chapter 2. You're probably thinking, oh no, Chapter 2! Didn't I warn you that it was going to come back? It's not too bad. In any case, the main component of bacterial cell walls is peptidoglycan. Okay. So the glycan comes from sugar, peptido from protein. So it's a sugar protein composite. Now this diagram here is the sugar portion. We have modified glucoses. Maybe it's glucai. Nah, glucose. We have modified glucoses that are hooked together and they uh, compose the sugar part of the peptidoglycan. Now one of the units, modified units, is NAG. I'm not going to make you remember the N-acetylglycosamine, but here is one part that's been modified, and we also have an amine group with some other fun stuff on it. Then NAM, over here, has this part modified from this part, and it also has this amine group. And we get this repeating, NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM. Now, in the book, they represent this as kind of a, a water noodle with uh, brown and pink segments. Okay, so that's the sugar portion. These little balls are amino acids that are hooked together to form peptides, a tetrapeptide and a hexapeptide that hook the water noodles together. You put these all together and you get a cell wall made out of peptidoglycan. Now with this one, this is a model of a gram-positive cell wall. It's got a very thick layer of peptidoglycan. Okay. Now, if you look at a gram-negative cell wall, it's got a very narrow band of peptidoglycan, and it's got a membrane on the outside. Okay. So what happens during the gram stain? with a gram-positive cell, the stain gets into the thick cell wall, then when the alcohol comes across, it doesn't really do too much to it unless you leave it on for too long. The cell wall can't stand it for uh, inevitably. Okay. So it retains the first stain. That's why it keeps the crystal violet. Now down here with our gram-negatives, what happens when the stain comes in, Okay, stains this outer membrane, it's got phospholipid heads, so the positive stain is attracted to the negative heads of the outer membrane. Then when that alcohol comes along, that alcohol busts up that outer membrane, washes it clear away. Then you put the secondary stain on to um, stain the cell. That's why they stain differently. Now there's also differences that I want you to remember. Gram positives have a molecule called tachoric acid. That's part of how biochemically we recognize gram positive cells. Gram negative cells have a molecule embedded in that outer membrane that's called LPS, lipopolysaccharide A. Um, actually it's uh, lipopolysaccharide, lipid A is the lipid part of that. Now why do I bring that up? In your body, if you get a lot of LPS floating around in your bloodstream, your immune system goes nuts. It sees it as a vast amount of invading bacteria and it overreacts and you go into what's called septic shock. So if you have a gram-negative infection, we have a tendency to want to be very careful about how fast we kill those bacteria so that we can prevent septic shock. So in review, you want to remember that gram-positives have a thick, peptidoglycan cell wall and that has tachoric acid in it. Gram negatives have a thin peptidoglycan cell wall with an outer membrane on the outside in which there is LPS. Now on to atypical prokaryotic cell walls. Let's start with mycoplasma. Mycoplasma are bacteria that have lost the ability to make cell walls. So when you look at them under the microscope, 
they form these almost amoeba-like blobs. They have a tendency to still be kind of long and skinny, but they don't have cell walls, and they can wiggle through filters. This is something to remember later on when we talk about um, control of bacteria. Um, it also makes it so that they are resistant to antibiotics that attack cell walls. Makes sense. They don't have cell walls. Now let's talk about archaea. Archaea have a type of cell wall component called pseudopeptidoglycan. It's very similar to peptidoglycan, but instead of nag and nam, they have nag and nat. And over here, I've got a lovely picture of what nat looks like. Uh, that's all you're going to have to remember. Now for acid fast bacteria, of which tuberculosis is caused by an acid fast bacterium, so is leprosy, they form a waxy coat around their cell wall. And it's made up of a lipid called mycolic acid. Remember that their um, fatty acids can have an acid group on the end of them. Well, this mycolic acid performs approximately the same function as a capsule. It prevents phagocytosis. It also means that acid fast bacteria are difficult to stain. That waxy coat does not have a real strong negative charge, therefore your basic stains don't want to stick to it. So we have a different staining protocol for staining acid fast bacteria. Mainly the acid fast staining protocol is only used in TB clinics or other places where you're expecting to see acid fast bacteria. Generally you do a gram stain first. It's easier, it's fast, breaks your uh, bacteria into two main groups. Also, because of this long lipid chain, it is expensive for the bacterium to make. So it slows down the growth of your acid fast bacteria. That's why tuberculosis is such a long term chronic disease. It resists your immune system and it grows slowly. Let's talk about how you can damage prokaryotic cell walls, specifically bacteria. Lysozyme is an enzyme that is naturally found in human tears, saliva, etc. that breaks apart the nag and nab subunits of peptidoglycan. This causes holes in the cell wall. This also leads to uh, the contents of the cells leaking out. Now some antibiotics go about it a different way. They attack the uh, tetrapeptides that hold the peptidoglycan, um, well, the uh, glycan units together. Uh, penicillin is an example of this. All right, that's it for part one, and we will come back and discuss the rest of the prokaryotic cell in part two.